Ça va, All Mathilda? Good. <laughs> All right. Well, hello and welcome to this political live interview with France's Europe Minister, Clément Beaune. I'm Rim Montaz, I'm a Politico's France correspondent, and I'm joined by my colleague Maya de la Baume, who covers uh, Brussels politics, uh, European politics in Brussels. Thank you all for joining us for this very exciting interview. We're very happy to have uh, Minister Bonn with us. Uh, please don't hesitate to send us your questions on Slido. So it's sli.do forward slash Politico Bonn and tweet using our hashtag, which is hashtag Politico Bonn. Welcome, Minister Bone. What an honor to have you with us. Thank you for the invitation. And what a great honor that you're doing this in English. I think this is a first. This is for me a first, yes. <laughs> I hope you had a guest speaking English before, but uh, I will no. do my best. Exactly. And I know that this is your first General Affairs uh, Council as Minister. You've yes. obviously been to Brussels a lot as Sherpa. And we can't help but notice but that you haven't been replaced yet at the Elysee. Are you still the Sherpa? No, I'm not. <laughs> But you know, uh, processes can take some time. Yeah. Uh, there were holidays. Uh, it was after a big summit, so you know, it's, it's coming. It will happen. It will happen. Right. Um, I'm going to hand it over immediately to Maya, actually, who's going to start our start us off. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank so my very first question is just your immediate reaction of uh, the announcement a few hours ago of the postponement of the European Council. So. Is this a new reality? And uh, do you think we will still have in-person summits? I do hope so. Uh, and as we say in, uh, in the French government, we have to live with the virus. This is part of it. Uh, we have to organize ourselves to adapt. Sometimes it's creating uh, some uh, problems, some uh, difficulties for organizing and uh, taking uh, organizing meetings. This is the case, even for leaders. I think it's a good thing that the rules are the same for everyone. I think that's what Charles Michel uh, demonstrated by saying that he's applying Belgian rules, living in Brussels. Um, I just wanted to reassure everyone here that I was in contact yesterday with Charles Michel, but he's uh, not uh, COVID positive. He's just in touch with somebody who was tested positive. Uh, so it's not the same rules applying at the second degree. Uh, but uh, no, indeed, I think it's a proof that the virus is still there. We still mm. have problems with this health crisis, which is a big pandemic. We don't know everything, so we have to live like this, unfortunately, and to adapt, because if we don't adapt, it means it would close everything, and we don't want to postpone everything, we don't want to delete or to uh, abandon everything. So I do hope there will be physical meetings. I do hope in this case the European Council will take place next week, so it's just a postponement by a week. But as far as I know, and it will be, of course, up to the European Council president to decide this European Council will take place just a few days later, but physically. And uh, I think we cannot do uh, everything uh, virtually online. It's very good to have this discussion now, uh, but we also need uh, discussions. We had the recovery plan at the July summit in Brussels, mm -hmm. uh, and we needed that. If we had not had a, a physical meeting, uh, we would have had no agreement, I think. Uh, so uh, for discussions which are sensitive as uh, when we will have on Turkey and Mediterranean and Belarus. We do need this political contact and this human contact between leaders as well. So actually on Turkey, since you know, you, you've brought it up, it's clearly a very uh, touchy issue. There's clearly still some division among the Europeans on how to move forward. Um, you said that there was a need for Turkey to take, to show some sort of goodwill, take some sort of action, some steps, additional steps before Thursday and Friday. Well, now they have a little bit more time. Uh, can you tell us a bit more in detail, what kind of gesture were you looking for from Turkey? Well, first you say there are some differences or divergences between member states. Well, it's true on all big foreign issues and it's, I mean, it's not a big surprise in a club of 27 with different histories, different sensitivities, different geographies. Um, it, so it does happen, let's not hide it. I think on this one, uh, we can also see the convergence which has taken place because between France and Germany, there were differences originally. I think now the gap has narrowed. Mm -hmm. um, again, there might be nuances, difference of relation to Turkey, to Greece, because of a lot of reasons, political background, uh, national communities, uh, the way we approach power and firmness, which 
is a big topic in EU yeah. international relation, we have to admit it. But I think we've worked quite well on it in this case because now it's not true to say that there is uh, some member states, for instance Germany, but others being very, very uh, soft on Turkey, it's not the case anymore, and other member states, say France, being so tough that they want to escalate and so on, which is not true. So of course we have to adjust, we still have some work to do, but I think we are on the right track to be honest. And as for France, I think the president, President Macron, was right to uh, say we have to uh, increase the pressure and to be a bit tougher because, I will go back to that, but because, sorry, uh, it's not a, a matter of, uh, it's not a crisis for one week or for two weeks. It's uh, the way we approach Turkey uh, it's the way Turkey develops a strategy, which I think is a long-term plan of influence towards Europe, of creating, to be frank, some dependency of Europe, the EU, towards Turkey. Uh, it's not the only power in the world to have this strategy. Uh, but So we have a tension now. Mm. We have to solve it. I think we know we need firmness to do so. But we will have to live with a difficult situation, I think, with some hot moments and some more cool, some cooler moments in this region, for sure. Um, so that's, that's, that's basically where we are. As for what we expect soon from Turkey, uh, I don't have a, a, a menu of, of options, of boxes to tick from Turkey. They have displayed some appeasement gestures uh, towards Greece mm -hmm. in the last days. I'm very cautious because it can move by the hour. Uh, this afternoon we had communication from Turkey to say they were ready to open discussions with Greece. Let's take it as a positive development, but we'll see. But and Cyprus seems to be the exactly. sticking point. Exactly, and I was in Cyprus last week also to, to demonstrate France's support, not only towards Greece, but towards Cyprus, because if the EU is a political club, is a power and means it, and we still have a lot, a long way to go, but I think we're on this track and France is very much focused on this. We cannot say whatever member state is concerned, okay, there's only one member state, only two member states, we do not care, it's far from us. It's not. If we are serious about being a political power, a political project, then we have to care about each member state's sovereignty. When you have a country like Turkey, and I saw it by my own eyes, having a boat in Cyprus waters, still now, uh, it is of course a, a threat directly uh, towards Cyprus. So it's not sufficient to have some signal uh, which are positive regarding Greece. We also need it towards Cyprus. And I could see, and we, can, we can understand, Cyprus is a small country, it's a divided island, they are stressed by this situation. We can understand, or we should understand this. And of course, we will not let them down. That was my message. So we also need some gestures, some words, and some concrete actions towards Cyprus as well. We will uh, assess the situation in the, I was saying, in the next days, now in the next 10 days, if the European Council is postponed. Uh, but we have to be aware it will be a long moment and a structural issue we have to deal with. But we're seeing that sanctions are difficult to impose mm -hmm. because of unanimity, because of various different issues that we'll get to. You said that all options would be on the table. And, you know, France speaks the language of power. It doesn't have a problem speaking the language of power. But France seems to be having a problem being explicit in its, langu in its language of power. Meaning, you know, explicit in what it's asking Turkey to do, in what it's threatening Turkey with at the end of the day. So I'm, I'm going to ask again, explicitly, what does that mean? You know, what are you expecting of them? And also, what could happen? What is the stick that is awaiting them? Well, I don't think we were uh, so implicit or so shy uh, last summer, months ago, actually. Uh, we sent some boats and some um, planes, military uh, elements in the Mediterranean Sea, not to create a conflict, of course, not to create escalation, but to demonstrate that we were serious and we were present uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. I think it's very concrete. I don't want, usually not my style, to be uh, too shy about uh, Europe's sovereignty or Europe's power, but uh, I'm not irresponsible. I don't have the final answer to this. Mm. We don't know exactly how far we need to go, but we've demonstrated that when it's needed, we are the ones pushing for a strong answer. Last year, we had, that's why I was insisting on the long-term dimension, we had this issue already, drillings in the Cyprus water from Turkey. We took sanctions. 
for the limited amount of mm. designations. Okay, but we took sanctions and we were active, I think, without France, to be blunt, sanctions would not have taken place. So it can happen again, but I don't want to say uh, it's not the way we <coughs> approach. We also fully respect Turkey and we want a dialogue in the long run. So I'm not saying that you have to tick all these boxes and we will do this and this. It's not, sorry, but it's not working like this. And I think it's not a matter of being too implicit or too shy again. Uh, but we know how far we can go. That said, I don't want to... Uh, uh, th th there is this European thing, if I can go a bit further, which is, uh, okay, we've been too soft traditionally. Uh, now we need to be a bit more firm, so it's sanctions. And the only tool we come up with is sanctions. Uh, no problem with that. It can happen. It happened in the past. We should take the sanctions now, and we've been too slow against Belarus. Um, it may happen again in the Mediterranean Sea. But uh, it should not be the only tough tool, if I may say. Military so what other tool? Military exercise yeah. has been an option when it was necessary to be there. Uh, it can happen again. And we can adapt uh, in words, in uh, diplomatic action like sanctions, in, in military presence. We can adapt our response. And I don't know in six months if we need to do something but else. But you seem to be alone with these military exercises. No, first we were not alone, de facto. We were four countries. Of mm -hmm. course, it's not all EU27, but this is quite normal. Uh, we are also present, it so it was Greece, France, Italy and Cyprus. We, were, we are present, France, directly in this uh, Irene uh, mm -hmm. military operation we have from the EU in uh, the, the area as well to protect uh, like infringements in Libya. Uh, it's too weak to be frank. Probably it should be strengthened. That's clear. Uh, totally transparent on this and blunt on this. But look at where we start from. Mm. I usually insist on because I really believe it. Europe has not been built as an outward looking project. It's true. And it's been a huge achievement in terms of being <laughs> inward looking. It has created peace or consolidated peace. It has reconciled member states. Now we go to European Council. Sometimes it's boring, sometimes it's long or frustrating, but it's better than doing war, frankly. And we always have to keep this in mind. But now, what we have to invent that we never invented, so probably uh, an evidence that it's not so easy, we never had at the European level, at the same time, cooperation, internal cooperation on external power, never. Mm -hmm. Not a huge, uh, not the best historian you can have on stage, but uh, just look at the last 200 years, it's already a while. Uh, we had power, we directed power against each other in Europe. We know how it ended up, ended with two world wars, which were actually uh, huge, destructive civil wars on the European continent mainly. And we invented, which was a huge and crazy uh, positive invention, the European projects. It helped like creating cooperation between us. But we were so bad at dealing with power that we just delegated it, if I may put it like that. We delegated it to NATO, to the US, to national states, of course, armies and so on. EU was not about this. So EU is learning that, hello, there are some powers on the doorstep, Russia, Turkey, just to mention two of them, the main ones, and they are not so nice. Mm. <laughs> so we have to unite and we have to develop tools, and we don't have them, if you ask me the question, yeah. at this stage. But yes, France is, I think, leading the way in this direction. And the novelty is that we are not alone. We are not all on the same page. We are not fully equipped with these tools of power, clearly. Uh, but we have understood that we need them, which is a big first step. And I think when I say we, it's not only France, or not even France and Germany. It's now a vast majority of EU member states. Um, on Belarus sanctions, I just heard you say a few minutes ago that we are too slow on sanctions. Is that true? And the question is then, but isn't France part of the problem since we are, I mean, sorry, we, France is supporting Cyprus in its concerns mm -hmm. over Turkey. So isn't, it, isn't France largely contributing to the current deadlock on sanctions? No. No, frankly, no. Belarus? I mean, you're right to, to, to be more precise. We've not been so slow on Belarus because a few days after the uh, fraudulent election, we had uh, uh, first meeting and we decided sanctions mid-August already. Then the list was established. There was a discussion. I don't, do, I don't go into all the details, but it was quite quick for something decided at 27. And this list is ready. Uh, it's blocked by Cyprus, true. 
uh, because they say, okay, I, I'm fully in agreement with the sanctions against Belarus, are actually quite tough against the Belarus regime, uh, but uh, I want to get my protection on, on Turkey, uh, which we understand. I think, on the contrary, by and I was clear on that yesterday, I was in the General Affairs Council clear with my Cyprus colleagues saying, okay, you should unlock the Belarus uh, sanctions because I think you are not doing a favor to yourself by creating this link. But and I think it helps, it's not unlocked right now, but it helps France and I hope the EU, the whole EU, is with you on uh, protection against Turkish provocations. And we've demonstrated it. We have been in agreement to have sanctions before. I was there a few days ago. President Macron uh, gathered Mediterranean countries and supported Cyprus in words and in actions very explicitly. I think, frankly, the most clear and firm support in the whole EU came from France to Cyprus. So I, I think, I hope, Cyprus is in no doubt of our support and I hope the EU supports. So frankly, I don't think France is leading Cyprus to create this linkage. We are trying to unlock it or to unbreak it, or to break it, sorry. Uh, but I, I, it's, it would be too easy from Paris to say, these guys in Cyprus, I don't understand what they're doing. I understand the stress. I, I saw it, I understand the stress. Uh, but I think the best answer is to have quick sanctions against Belarus and to go on with full support from France on this discussion with Cyprus and Greece about what do we do in the Mediterranean Sea. Mm. Uh, another question about Belarus. Uh, is France, or does France really want to include the president of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko, on the list of sanctions? Because I wasn't, it's not clear to me that France is really supporting that. So. I don't want to be too precise on that because there was a foreign affairs uh, meeting yesterday and the question was not decided to be frank, uh, but we are open to it. Uh, we can, uh, it, it depends on the development in the, the strategy to mm -hmm. be very, mm -hmm. as far as I can go, to be very explicit uh, before was to have a first bunch of sanctions very quickly and not to exclude additional sanctions, including the Belarus president uh, in, in, in second step. Now, since we have lost some time, the debate we have, and I think France and Germany are open to it, is to have one bigger list, possibly including President Lukashenko, uh, as, a, as a first and complete answer. Mm -hmm. But just as a follow-up on the position of, of France on the sort of the Cyprus positioning right now, is France sending uh, conflicting messages? Because what we know is what we've been told last week you know, France wasn't one of the 15 countries that said there should be sanctions on Belarus. It, it took kind of more ambiguous positions, said, you know, we understand the Cyprus position. Now you're saying you yesterday said very clearly to Cyprus she needs to unlocked, unlock the situation on them. So is that now the new French position? Uh, frankly, I don't think, I mean, we have been f clear from the beginning that we need sanctions against Belarus. So if we need sanctions uh, against Belarus, we need to deliver them. Mm -hmm. and if France was like not concerned about s s the timeline and the process, you would say to me, rightly so, uh, you, would, you say you want sanctions against responsible for the oppression in Belarus, but you don't care about z z the rapidity or yeah. the... No, no, we want that. And if we want that, we have to go where the issue is, Cyprus. And so we say to them, please, like, let's go fast. Yeah. Um, so I'm frank and explicit, and I don't have double language. I say that also to, to Cyprus colleagues. But I do understand, and I think we understand more than anyone, why Cyprus is doing that. And the reason why they do that is that they have a doubt about the level of support from the EU uh, towards Turkey. And that's on this that we are working. It would be just easy and this would be unfair to go to Cyprus and say, please accept the sanctions and get Belarus and we'll see later for your problem. Mm. No, we are working on both. So what more will be needed so that the sanctions are imposed on Belarus and then Turkey at the European Council meeting, since Cyprus is clearly asking for something? Yeah, because they want to know what will happen with Turkey. So basically, I'm not saying that we want to be... Uh, uh, tougher just for being tough uh, with Turkey. We should be as tough as needed. Mm. If Turkey, and I don't know, that's up to them, comes to us and say, okay, uh, I've done the first signal with the boat in the Greek waters, now I'm ready to open a dialogue, or, or, and or I'm ready to withdraw the boat from 
Cyprus, let's hope so, let's be optimistic. Mm. Then it's a different story, and then we don't need to be as tough or to imagine sanctions or measures or whatever. If not, then we have to assess the situation according to what Turkey is doing. So I'm sorry it's a bit uh, moving targets because we don't know exactly. And I think what we have been clear about, what France has been clear about, is that when there is a provocation, we are ready to react. Mm. But we don't want to be in a kind of warfare situation. We want f our goal, our long-term goal, is, as the president, as president Macron put it, peace and stability in the Mediterranean Sea. We are not the ones which have created those tensions. Mm. What we have changed, I think, in the European software is to say, which usually is a way to think in the EU, to say, when there is a tension or provocation, let's hide and hope that it will go for the better in one week, one month, one year. It never works like that. The more you are weak, the weaker you are, the stronger the other is. So I think by having this tough, credible language, we are also helping dialogue to resume. Is the EU also kind of now um, suffering from that kind of approach on another subject, which is migrants and refugees. Mm -hmm. We're seeing that 13,000 refugees or migrants uh, in Moria are causing such a real problem for, for the EU. Is the EU unable truly to deal with, at the end of the day, such a manageable problem? I mean, what's the issue here? No, you're right. But I think if the issue was, not, was only 30,000 people, that's it, probably it would be easier to find a solution. I mean, as you know, the issue is that we, there is a background in all this, which is a 2015-2016 mm -hmm. crisis, which blocked the European solidarity system. This solidarity does not exist. Um, and we are trying to find ad hoc solutions to emergency issues. And France, to be very clear and frank, has always been there for each of these emergencies. Uh, we are the country since 2018, which in all emergency cases, I'm talking about the boats, for instance, in the Mediterranean Sea, has taken the most, the highest number of people in the, I don't like the word, but in the distribution mm -hmm. of people in need of protection. So the, the biggest number with Germany. We are the two countries which in, all, in every single case have taken people. You may say it's not enough and so on, okay, maybe, but we've been always there. And again for Greece, when the Greek Prime Minister phoned President Macron in February when there was a problem at the border, another provocation uh, by Turkey, mm -hmm. we committed to take 700 on the whole. And now we said we will talk uh, a few hundred a few more hundred. probably. Uh, I don't have the, thing, the exact numbers, but it's around thousands mm -hmm. to help Greece on this whole issue since the beginning of the year. And our asylum office has been the first to go to Moria and to Lesbos and to Athens and to assess the situation. So we've been there. The issue is not what France is doing in emergency cases. We are doing things. It's probably the structural response. When there is, we cannot work like that with a phone call each time there is a boat or a fire or whatever. We will yeah, you're plugging holes. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly, that's true. And we need now a comprehensive system. Tomorrow the Commission will present a new initiative, very much needed given the absence of sustainable answer or s mechanism. And I do hope, I do think, the Commission will propose a permanent solidarity mechanism, uh, which uh, needs to take into account the different situations, so it might be a bit complex. But the substance is we need this permanent solidarity mechanism and if we want it to happen, to be agreed by all 27 member states, we need to go beyond what had been proposed in 2015, 2016, as the mandatory, mandatory quotas. Mm. I think solidarity should be mandatory and we could have a bit more flexibility in the way we organize this solidarity. But you know, a year ago when you gave us a, an exclusive interview about President Macron's yes. uh, plans for Europe, migration was the one thing you highlighted and you told me exactly those terms. I made was an interview, I think, for the priorities of 2020. It so here we are. Exactly. No, true. But and I still think, yeah. The, nine the months COVID later, yes, we're, was we're still debating the same issue. This proposal the Commission will do tomorrow, will, will make tomorrow, were due to happen mid March. Yeah. COVID took place. Not that migration disappeared, de facto, it stopped quite a lot because of the crisis. Uh, but we focused on other emergencies that I could not plan, sorry, in my interview last year. And uh, we have now more action in health, in recovery, and I think it's a big success. And in, on these emergencies, EU did its job, I think. Yeah. Very much so, recovery. But has there been but, progress? But I still believe, that's why I said it before the COVID crisis, that we did not anticipate, that uh, the big topic 
on which people still think, I believe, that Europe is not doing enough, is not bringing a European response, is migration. I mm. still believe that. Mm. You have climate, you have other big topics, but migration is probably the issue on which people have the feeling that it's still a mess and there's not no EU coordination, EU response. So I do hope the Commission proposal will be ambitious enough and will create this landing zone for a European solution. So what can you tell us about this migration pact tomorrow? I'm sure you know more than us. Yes, but <laughs> we'll I will not the say the on, uh, on political live events what the <laughs> Commission will propose because Are it you will confident not be fair. The mandatory quotas will what be I can included. share with you is what we think and I hope what has been taken on board uh, by the Commission, I hope, and they will present the whole, uh, uh, the whole uh, package tomorrow. It's not my job to do it and I don't know the whole thing exactly. But uh, what I believe we should do is to have these two pillars of responsibility and solidarity. Responsibility because you still need responsibility, of course. It's not being open to everyone. It's not uh, saying we can take all migrants in Europe. Of course not. And it's not saying that a first entry country has no role to play. Each country has a role to play. France is also a big country for asylum requests, the biggest last year in Europe, actually. Uh, it's more like what we call secondary movements, people entering somewhere and going to France. But so we are directly concerned. And these countries have a responsibility to register migrants, to do a first screening of the situation, assessment of the situation, and to organize as much as we can returns, which is a big, uh, a big hole in our system now. Of course, even for that, they need Greece, Italy, France for secondary movements, European supports from our border protection agency, Frontex, that we have to strengthen uh, to organize the screening and so on. So, but a responsibility pillar with EU support and a solidarity pillar, which is not existing at the moment, just ad hoc solidarity, not organized European solidarity. This is a big novelty we need to introduce, and I think, I hope the Commission will introduce it in its new proposal. Uh, and there, I think, if we want it to be efficient at the end, effective, we need to go beyond the uh, mandatory quotas. What does that mean, I think? It means that the rule should be that you share the, I don't like the word burden, mm -hmm. but the, the necessity to welcome refugees, people in need of protection. There's no reason why Greece or Italy or Malta or Cyprus should be alone in welcoming these people who have a right for asylum. It should be shared, okay? And if a country say, for some reason, I will not, then they need to contribute in a different manner as a derogation, as an exception, uh, which I think can be a financial contribution, but not only. I think it would be a mistake to have only a financial contribution. It should be organizing returns. It should be sending people for Frontex to the mm. first entry country, mm. because it's also a, a human question we are debating. You cannot do, do, do a check and say, I don't care about refugees and I will pay. Mm. It's not enough. You have to do something concrete to, to, to demonstrate European solidarity. I think, I hope, you will see tomorrow, it's not for me to say, that the Commission will present something along these lines, which mm. would be good. Um, if we go back to, uh, not go back, but if we start um, another very important issue that is the EU's recovery plan, uh, spe specifically the uh, rule of law conditionality, which mm -hmm. I think is one of the most important issues now. Yes. Um, France has clearly been saying rule of law is clearly something that is to me, non-negotiable. And back in July, you agreed on a text w uh, in which the language was pretty soft. Um, how far are you now ready to go to defend the rule of law in sort of s in a bold way? Like, how are you ready for a clash with Hungary and Poland, which have threatened to veto the recovery plan if ever you know they're not satisfied about rule of law? How ambitious France is on that, you know? Very ambitious on this. And I think the story will not end up uh, with this debate and this regulation. I will come back to that in the coming weeks. It, it's here again, it's, it's a kind of toolbox, if I may say, that we have to build. Go, going back, reverting to, to, to the July agreement, it's true that we could have, I mean, we would have liked to go further, but okay, let's see the first steps. First, France played a huge role and I can testify President Macron himself in writing down for the first time, uh, agreed unanimously, uh, a conditionality in this respect. 
never happened before. And I think it's very good to say in a budgetary text, you have also a link with rule of law and with uh, respect of basic values. First time, and including Hungary, Poland agreed to that. That said, it's not the end of the story. Now we have to negotiate the substance. Uh, the European Parliament is putting a lot of pressure to be more ambitious, and I'm very much on this page. It will be difficult to find a compromise because Hungary and Poland, I was still in a meeting about this this afternoon, are saying we want, of course, it to be as tough as we can. I'm quite optimistic we will have a regulation creating a conditionality in this rule of law uh, and this rule of law elements. The question is what is the scope, what are the cases that you take into account as rule of law breaches, uh, and what is the governance, qualified majority most likely, we have to stick to that, and uh, how effective it is in practice. I'm quite confident with the pressure from the European Parliament, with our commitments, I was clear this afternoon for France, other countries pushed in the direction of being ambitious, I think we will have a regulation creating this link in the coming weeks and months. I hope so, we will fight for that, I will fight for that. Is it enough? No. Uh, and is it the end of the story? Again, no. I think it for the first time we will have a financial instrument used mm. to protect rule of law. But we should look on screen all the instruments that EU is using to check whether we cannot have more. For instance, just take a very s maybe simple but concrete example. You have these uh, outrageous LGBT zones in Poland local authorities sometimes encouraging it or creating that. Very difficult to, to target from a legal point of view because usually just a, 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 s a billboard, a signal in shops and so on, very difficult to, to catch. But the European Commission, I talked with the commissioner in charge this morning, um, Ms. Dali, she said, okay, in these places, in these um, uh, towns, cities, we will uh, suspend EU funding for twinning or whatever. So she took a tool, very concrete, very simple, and she said, I will suspend the funding. Uh, why not check all the tools in which we can do that? Because we will have, I hope, this first step, but it's only a first step with the regulation. It's clear that we, we should strengthen our tools to make sure rule of law is respected. It's a big fight. It's a long-term fight. I think it's also my generation. I'm not so young now, but it's my generation's fight. Mm -hmm. Because when you see people in Belarus and so on fighting for values, risking their lives for that and so on, it's not acceptable. I'm not comparing Lukashenko with anyone in the EU. That would mm. be stupid and that would be untrue. But still, we have problems in our countries, in the EU. People, especially in Eastern Europe, fought recently, it's less than a generation ago, for joining the EU, for joining Europe as a political project because they thought it was about freedom, about values, about media pluralism and so on and so forth. If we are not able to protect that, people will not understand why we are doing all this. It's not about being firm with only about being firm with Turkey or with Russia and so on, it's also within our club. So uh, to be concrete, I hope we have the best regulation we can, the most ambitious regulation we can, and it's already good to have something. But how do you convince them, Hungarians, Pol Polish people? It's a mix you, in the council what it's a mix uh, it's a mix mm. of political pressure mm. and discussion negotiation. Uh, I, I, for instance, uh, in July, uh, Mr. Orban or, or Mr. Morawiecki, they realized that for a lot of countries, including France, it was very important to have something. And then we, w we would not have got an agreement, I think, with Nordic countries, even with France and Germany, with, no, with nothing about rule of law. We needed that because we had committed to, because I think for the public opinion it's important, for uh, a lot of citizens all over the EU it's important. And, uh, in the end, they see that this political pressure plays a role. So I'm afraid we only have five more Sorry. minutes left. Too long. And I just want to get to two concrete questions because you were talking about concrete things. The first one is coronavirus, and we're seeing how it's much it's weakening the Schengen zone, mm -hmm. how difficult it is to go from one place to another, how separated lovers are. They haven't been able to see each other for a long time, you know, partners. Uh, that's one question. We have a question from the audience that says, you know, how will France support the creation of a European health union? I think that's sort of connected to that. And the other concrete thing that is very important for our readers is what happens with the plenary uh, in October? Is it going to take place in Strasbourg? And if it's not going to take place in Strasbourg, what is France going to do concretely to defend that seat? I will start with this one. 
Uh, I do hope so. There are two sessions, to be pre precise, sorry, in, in, in October. Mm -hmm. First one, uh, early October. We do hope it, it takes place in Strasbourg. Living with the virus also means having a democratic life with the virus. We will not stop having a parliament, having sessions because of the virus. Of but course, it hasn't stopped and it's been going on yes, in Brussels. Yes, exactly. But it, I'm sorry, but in the treaties and it's a fact, the, 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 the European Parliament has its plenary sessions in Strasbourg. Uh, so you should, uh, we should go back to this democratic normality in spite of the virus. We are not crazy. We worked like hell with the European Parliament, the Strasbourg city, local authorities, our health agency, to make sure that there would be checks, controls, sanitary measures, to make sure the session could take place. So we're ready. So now I say to, I don't want to be in a kind of war. It's, I mean, if we want the parliament back in Strasbourg, where it has its headquarters, it's because we like having the parliament in Strasbourg. It's not a war, no, but it's true. If people in Strasbourg, people in France would not like having the European parliament, we would not insist. So, and we spend a lot of money to improve the access. It's not perfect. I was in Strasbourg a week ago, and I, uh, I said we will have a new contract with the city to improve access in the three coming years. Uh, so we are serious about the Parliament, the European Parliament being welcome in Strasbourg. So I don't want to say uh, this is uh, France against the rest of Europe. I don't think it's like that. And I talked to heads of groups in the European Parliament with President Sassoli. President Sassoli, I must say, is very committed to Strasbourg, so now let's be responsible but true to our treaty, to our values, to our democratic organization. It has to go back to Strasbourg. That's what or I else? Say. Or else I don't want to have threats. Uh, we can have legal case, if that's what you mean. Okay, it can happen. Why not? But it European takes time. Court of Justice, you it could It happened do that? in the past. We did it when necessary. But I don't want to be in this state of, of mind. Uh, I will take my phone again. President Macron will talk to President Sassoli. I will talk myself to President Sassoli uh, at a more modest level, but I will have this discussion. Uh, I think there are, there are people who don't like going to Strasbourg, that's clear. And I say to them, I don't think the green arguments and so on are very relevant because, you know, you have also like creating new buildings in Brussels and so on in terms of mm. um, green footprint is not great either. So that's a big debate. Uh, there is a green mayor in Strasbourg. She's very much attached to having uh, the parliament in Strasbourg. So, you know, I think it's, it goes beyond. And sometimes it excuses. Mm. But there are a lot of European uh, members of um, MEPs, of staff of the European Parliament, President Sassoli himself, who wants to come to Strasbourg. So I say to them, let's organize. Let's, if there are some... Uh, uh, fears about the situation, the sanitary situation, let's discuss, but I can tell you it's not worse than in, in Brussels, at the same level. Uh, that's it. So I, I don't want to be in a kind of, I want to be firm and clear defending Strasbourg, that's, that's sure. Uh, that's why I've, I was there, but I don't want to be in a kind of conflict. Mm. And on coronavirus? Uh, sorry, on we coronavirus. We have to end on that. Sorry, yes, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> we'll it's, end on French presidency. It's, uh, yeah. it's very concrete and very important. We had a debate again this afternoon uh, in, in, the, in the council here. We have to harmonize our criteria because it's a mess at the moment. Well, it's a mess because there is a difficult sanitary situation first, I must say. And as long as we have the virus, we will have difficulties and we want to target the measures. And targeting the measures also, uh, also means within one country, sometimes within one region, not only at the EU level, that you have differences in terms of measures from one town to one other city and so on. But we have to f base our decision on the same criteria. Uh, the number of cases and so on, that's what we are fighting for at the European level. Just to be quick on that, because it's a long debate, I think we can have them in the coming weeks, I hope. There was a broad political agreement this afternoon in the Council to harmonize these criteria. If we have this harmonized criteria, at least we have uh, less chaos, more visibility, more predictability, so that people can just have, I hope, a normal uh, way to move around Europe. So coordinated risk assessment, you mean? Exactly, that's mm -hmm. what we are working on. I just want to insist on one final point because I think we should also say when the EU is doing a great thing, uh, uh, links to coronavirus, vaccine. Mm -hmm. We are all hoping that there will be a vaccine soon. For the first time, there was no competency, no organization for this. The EU, as a club, is negotiating with all big pharmaceuticals big farmers uh, to have a contract for all Europeans so that when the vaccine is there, we have a guarantee of rapid vaccination for all Europeans, not one country against the other in the EU, all EU together. This is very good and I hope we will see the effect of this as soon as we can. Yeah.
So one final forward-looking <laughs> question. Um, France will have its uh, EU presidency in 2022. Glad you mentioned it. True. <laughs> um, so what are, how will you make it a success in the sense, like what were, would be the three main achievements that you would, that France would want to see concluded maybe during the presidency? And you have one minute to tell us. I'll just three and three, stick to three. I'll, I'll <laughs> just have some, some I, I hope we have a migration package, which is, yeah. I hope before actually, but if not, we will, I hope, finish it. Uh, very important to have some other tools on rule of law. I mean it. Uh, we are I'm still building the agenda. We are building the agenda, but uh, this regulation very important, but it's not the end of the story on how we fight more efficiently for rule of law uh, in the EU. And final thing, which is precisely forward-looking, the uh, Conference of the Future of Europe. It will be concluded, I uh, hope it will be launched soon and concluded during the French presidency. Launched in November? I hope so. I hope so. I say this is the goal. And Who is the president? Don't know. That's why it's not now. It's a few, in a few weeks because we still have to solve this issue. But uh, by the French presidency, we will have a president and an efficient results, I hope. And no, but seriously, I think the big issue is to change the European software. It's not only a list of measures and actions. It matters. But how we think our relation to China, to the US, are we confident enough? Can we be firm enough when there is a threat? as the one we are seeing now. This conference on the future of Europe is a way to have the list of policies, measures, I hope in an open manner with citizen panels and so on, to define our roadmap for the next five to ten years. And I hope that would be a big honor that we can conclude this and have this roadmap on the table um, first semester 2022 in Strasbourg. Okay, good. Well, very last question just for was there too much English in Ursula von der Leyen's State of the Union speech? I know that a lot of French people want you to answer that question because it was a... Yeah, if you ask me, I would say yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the beauty of the, the thing is that Ursula von der Leyen, I, I must uh, reveal, uh, is a very good French speaker. Uh, sometimes maybe she doesn't do it, she doesn't dare to do it enough, but if I may say something, she can do it because I know she speaks well uh, and I know also she's very attached to uh, multilingualism so let's all demonstrate it better. I, it's quite uncomfortable to say this now because I'm speaking English <laughs> as a French person but on va le faire. Great, thank you so much Clément Vaughan for joining us and thank you to all of our online uh, participants. Thank you, Rim. Thank you, Maya. And uh, you can send also your feedback to events at politico.eu. I think it's very important for us to have your feedback. So thank you so much uh, to all of you and to you. Thank Merci. you. <laughs> Merci. <laughs>